Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NACOM Core Operations Management Session, the kitchen sink of court administration, or things you didn't know that you needed or need to know as a court administrator. I'm Erica Payne Santiago, Deputy Court Administrator and Jury Commissioner for the Circuit Court of Prince George's County, Maryland. Our distinguished panelists include today Kelly Hutton, Assistant Court Administrator, Unit 1 in the North Dakota Court System. Kelly currently is the Vice Chair of the Core Committee. She has worked for the North Dakota Court System since January 2007 and currently works with the Statewide Case Flow Management Committee, chairs the Digital Recording Workshop and the Technology Subgroup. Tina Madison, Deputy Court Administrator for the Pima County Consolidated Justice Courts. Tina is a member of the Arizona Association for Superior Court Administrators. From 2015 to 2018, she served on the Supreme Court of Arizona's Court Security Standards Committee. She has spent over 20 years within the court system to include the California Superior Court and Pima County Managing Court Operations and array of other specialty courts. Both are members of the NACOM and ICM Fellows. Can we please give our panelists a warm welcome of applause? All right, thank you so much for being here. It's really great. And I want to thank all of our virtual attendees as well. Um, this is, it's so wonderful to be in person. And I know we keep saying that over and over again, but it, it really is. Um, uh, operations management, I, 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 we kind of want to get a sense of who's in the room. And for those playing um, at home, um, if you can just type in chat, we'll, we'll be monitoring the chats as well. So how many supervisors um, in the room? Oh, all right. We got a good number of supervisors, managers, administrators. Yeah. They're all the same up. hands. OK, uh, coordinators. <laughs> Directors, okay, judges. Okay. Huh? Okay, okay, that's okay. Um, it, it, National Center, courts, staff, other, others, and yeah. anything I didn't didn't name. Yeah. What, what do we have? Aspiring. Aspiring. Oh, I like it. This is for you. Is okay, so everybody else. Sorry, this is for her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, um, how many are in their jobs um, less than five years? Five to ten years. Ten plus years. Okay, and the, um, I don't want to correct the, the bio on me. It, it has been over 30 years for me. So, <laughs> and there's a few of you in the audience as well. Um, and I, I ask these questions to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and what we're going to be talking about today, the operations management, and um, and also get a sense of, of who's, go, okay, all right, I'll step to the side, uh, who, who's also thinking, who's maybe thinking about transitioning or looking for that career development, and if you're sitting next to your boss, blink twice. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so with the great resignation, we're seeing a lot of change, a lot of people moving, a lot of doing different jobs. One of the things in my bio, I, was, I worked in California for 23 years, and then I moved over to, actually 28 years, and then I moved over to Arizona. And so um, it, this course to me spoke uh, to me as operations management. It used to be called the... Um, essential components, but we've now changed it, we've upgraded it, our curriculum. And so it's just, it, it is all of the other things that you need to know. So that's why we went with oh, I'm gonna, kitchen sink. So there's a couple of idioms, the kitchen sink, I didn't know this, it was, um, sometimes it's called slice of life. Um, so if you read a kitchen sink novel, um, it's about daily daily life, um, and for me, I prefer fantasy because I live daily life, and I'd rather go into the sci-fi fantasy realm. But kitchen sink is also that day-to-day -day drama reality. Um, so that's a novel. Those are the type of novels or TV shows, maybe not 
reality shows like Housewives of Orange County. But then there's the everything but the kitchen sink idiom, which is it's, it's all encompassing. It's everything. It's including. So I looked up the definition of that. Where did that come from? And, and they used to talk about how armies would throw everything at the opposing forces, everything but the kitchen sink when they ran out of ammunition, right? So they'd just chuck everything they could at them. So that's where you, where you get those things. And, and really, again, essential components, operations, management. There's so many facets of our jobs as court leaders in court management that include all of these facets. And we only have um, 90 minutes. No, less than 90 minutes. 75? Yep. OK. Um, hour 15. Math. Carry the one. Carry the one. It, that's, that's what we've got today. So um, I think that's I think that's it for just the high level overview for me. Oh, All right. So what do you guys think of when you think of operations management or court operations? Just shout it out. If you're on, online, type it in the chat. The weeds. That's good. Good. What else? Behind, Behind the, the scenes. scenes. Like that, yeah. SOP. What was that? SOP. SOP. Acronym for Standard Operating, Operating Procedures. Procedures. See, I should know that. Standing? <laughs> Standard. Standard. <laughs> Anyone else? Any? Thing that has to happen for the court to, to function every day. Sure. You'll hear one of my favorite things is all the things. All the things. We need to do all the things. All right, nothing online. So let's go. Online in the chat, we have uh, things that say glue that holds it all together and behind the scenes, budget, SOP, et cetera. I'll see another SOP. <laughs> all the things. All the we'll things. Keep saying it, all the things. Uh, so this content for this session is really built um, through our core curriculum, which is really the heart of NACOM. We have this educational set of curriculum. Um, there's 13 uh, competencies, and the core has really been around in NACOM for over 30 years. So as you can see on your screen, um, there's three modules that all of these competencies are broken down into. There's principle, practice, vision, and it's really small print, but it covers all of the things. And one of them is operations management. So if you're in this room today, you are already participating in the core champion program. So give it a, give it a shake. Uh, we also had a couple of sessions yesterday. Um, what the core champion program is, is it's just a way to gain familiarity with the core. So the goals are to strengthen our court professionals, um, provide greater exposure to core, um, and it really recognizes your attendance. So you could have a tangible to go back to your court and say, hey, I attended these sessions, I'm getting credit, I'm working towards a certificate. Uh, and there are five certificates that you could receive based on where you are in the program. So the board just voted this last weekend to move it to phase two, which means that you will also be able, if you are a member of NACOM, to go back and watch any of our sessions that have previously qualified. Including this one, if you yep. want to rewatch it. Yep. Just saying. <laughs> you will. It's going to be good. <laughs> so it also allows anybody in your court that is a member of NACOM that doesn't have the opportunity to come to these conferences to really participate and get that baseline of education. So. Hopefully, you will also share that when you go back to your court as well. I talk faster than the words that I have written here. So the learning objectives for today, um, each one of our core curriculum have learning objection ob objectives. Uh, so it's really to recognize the role of operations management within the court organization. Um, we're going to identify some court operation service and programs. Like Tina said, it's 75 minutes. So we're going to try to just blast a lot of information at you. If we don't get through it all, it's because there's a lot. And really just to understand the various infrastructure and support um, needed for our court organizations. To give you an idea, this curriculum would take 16 hours if we went through the whole thing. Sometimes we've done it in longer. Actually, yeah. we've taken two and a half days um, for, for this program. 
Okay, so um, I have um, organizational content. This is really talking about how our um, actual manual, if you go online, this is what the book looks like. So, and it's 117 pages. So it's a lot of material to go through. Um, as Kelly said, it's a, a lot of hours. And basically what we're, we're trying to acknowledge is that courts are really complex organizations. And we know that you need to, as leaders and aspiring leaders, you need to know a lot of these, what, what could come underneath your belt? For those of you thinking about moving, you know, I, I went from Arizona to Cal California to Arizona. The structures are different. Um, so you have to learn all new state statutes, legislation, but you also, there are always legislative changes that come across and you have to understand what these programs and policies and things that impact you as a manager. So when we develop the curriculum, you, can, you will see these bullets. It, it, it introduces the concept at a high level and then it takes you down to knowledge, skills, and abilities and, and, and areas that you need to know as a court leader. And then some of the challenges and, and, and things that you're gonna face or you might come up against in dealing in all these areas. So we recognize, um, I asked you know, how many people were different, um, your different roles, but how many are different court jurisdictions do we have represented here? Do we have appellate courts? Okay, I know there's a couple of uh, attendees. They, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, uh, general jurisdiction courts, limited jurisdiction courts. Okay, and some of your courts, maybe we have a smaller, um, maybe you're a single case type. You're only dealing with a juvenile court or you have multiple case types. So again, a lot of different areas within our, within NACOM, within this audience, you see it, there's so many different areas that this can um, impact um, our operations management. And like I said, you might have this function, you might have this function in, um, I'm sorry, there was a chat <laughs> oh, question. We've, we've got other uh, types of jurisdictions from the chat, environmental, administrative and municipal and others in the state courts. Perfect. So some of you might have these functions, but some of you might not. And again, as a leader, it, it's just kind of rounding you out to understand what some of your other jurisdictions and other partners might, might be dealing with as well. And for those of you looking to move, what you might be experiencing or what you might see in these other areas. Um, so we're not going to get too deep into the 117 pages of operations management, but we're going to just highlight each of the different areas for you. And as a NACA member, you can download the whole curriculum and read it tonight. <laughs> it's all in there, but there's activities. So if you wanted to host a session in your own courts, it kind of walks you through how to do that. Our curriculums are set up to really anybody could walk in and, and teach some of this stuff if you if you follow the program. So. All right, so what is the operations management competencies? And we have it broken out into four major areas. We have services required by the Constitution or federal regulations, access and direct services, programs and special services, and infrastructure and support. And we'll go into each of these areas just a little bit more. Again, we're gonna keep it high level, but even within these four areas, there are still sub, more subcategories that you can delve deeper. Um, there's like a lot of program management throughout these, these areas, as well as grant man management, financial management. You've got some succession planning. Who here attended the workforce management session? So a succession planning and, and how are you developing your staff to take over some of these areas will play into it as well. Um, some performance management, information, statistics, data analysis, research, again, are all going to kind of play into these. We're just not going to be talking about them um, specifically, but again, those are some of the subcategories within this competency of operations management. But these are the four areas that we're going to highlight. 
So as Tina was kind of touching on here, it's really an interrate related curriculum. We talked about the modules and all the different competencies. You will hear us say many of these throughout when we're talking about technology. It's going to touch on case flow. It's going to touch on all the things you need to do in your office. So just keep it in mind that even if we don't expand upon case flow, there's a whole module out there that would give you the information on that. Um, because while well, managing court operations, you need to consider all of the things. You need to consider equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, yeah. So the first one we are going to go through uh, are the services required by the Constitution or federal regulations. Um, obviously, the first one is very dear to all of us. It's jury functions. So what could be some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you would need to effectively do your jury. Anybody? Shout it out. Jury utilization. Jury utilization. So now, thank you. Technology uh, applications that go along with jury management. Technology, like a jury management system. There's going to be lots of options to participate, so don't all of you talk to us at once. <laughs> Community relations? Yes. Okay. Those are good starts. Any online, Brandon? Okay, so you also have to be familiar with the rules and statutes. How many jurors you need to bring in. Um, you have to prepare the master list, the summons. I, every day I think, thank God for technology because before I started in the clerk's office, they would put all the names in the like bingo jar and they would rotate them <clears> and they would pull them out and then you'd have to type them. And I was, <laughs> I just couldn't imagine. You have to ensure your pools are random, that it's reflective of your community. Um, effective use, you have to order food for them. You have to pay for them to get to your courthouse. Make sure that they have access, ADA, all of the things. Brandon, did they add any online? Not yet. Okay, so how about, what are some of the challenges? Do we have any jury managers in here? Nobody, okay. Anybody that just works with jury in their office, like our clerks do the jury. Okay, I'm gonna call on you guys. So what are some of the challenges you're facing in your courts with your jury functions? Willingness to participate. Willingness to participate. That's a great one. Where to put them. Where to put them. COVID taught us a lot about making sure people have their space, right? Rick? Bad data for addresses. For yes, contact information. Um, yes. Getting the jurors to actually show up. That is a problem everywhere. Like, I would love to be a juror. I think it would be fascinating, but that's why we work where we work. <laughs> Online, we're hearing challenges with appropriate space for jurors uh, and also the deliberation witnesses and other space challenges. Yep. Also, juror satisfaction. Yes. Yeah, How many of you did remote jury trials during the pandemic? <laughs> Ellen? Yeah, but just support for jurors trying to use our technology to participate remotely. Yes, which resulted in us, like people expect every trial to be streamed. Who has the staff for that? <laughs> so staffing, right? So piggyback on the Sure, when they don't show up, how to hold them accountable. That's a great one. What do you what do you guys do? Uh, nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's common. Usually you maybe you just have just enough to get through. We'll show cause them, and then if they don't show up for the show cause, we'll issue a bench warrant. Yep. That's good. Scott? We're seeing uh, a growing number of, we're seeing a growing number of accommodation challenges. So, you know, jurors that want to participate but may have some challenges uh, to in either showing up at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Our courthouses are somewhat aged mm -hmm. and it's trying to get them there and get them to participate. We may have some attitudes that need to change as well about disabilities. Yeah, or language access. Jurors maybe needing some accommodations in that area. Zanelle up here in the front. I'm trying to make sure jury service is seen as a primary citizen duty, um, using the media to help us get that message out. So sort of rebranding it, mm -hmm. that it's not something that you should avoid but you should be excited like we are. Oh yeah, I, I got a notice, I wanna go, I wanna serve. Have you done any media campaigns on that subject? The media is only interested when we do the show causing to find 
<laughs> or what the sentence is, right? They yes. want the juice, not mm -hmm. the... Yeah, so that ties into public relations, which is another core curriculum. Oh, sorry, I forgot there's three more <laughs> on here. So the next one is indigent defense services. Um, you know, this is constitutionally mandated for criminal cases. Who else has any rule requirements for other case types? We have some for juvenile cases in our court or in a child support hearing if they're gonna face some jail time. Just making sure they have that, but do any of you have them for victims in cases that you're required to appoint for? No? Okay. So what do you think some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities we need as court administrators, supervisors, line staff, um, to ensure that we are making sure we're following our indigent defense guidelines? Just knowing the rules, right? That's a big one. What about, oh, go ahead. In Michigan, they recently changed the protocol and they moved the obligation for indigent defense services generally, especially in criminal cases, from the courts to the executive branch. Okay. So engaging in that transition of a function the courts traditionally perform to the executive branch and recreating or mirroring a structure provided a number of interesting challenges. Okay, so I'm gonna paraphrase for the online people, but essentially moving it from a court function to an executive branch function. Um, how many of you appoint through your courts? Okay. And how many of you have it? It's more of an executive branch function. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what do you guys see as some of the challenges? Oh, Scott. Uh, indigent, defense, indigent defense services, they're having a struggle just like every other, every other organization is in getting uh, new staff, new, being able to pay them, knowing what their limitations are. They're uh, limited in time. Uh, I think part of the pandemic has actually helped them with the use of Zoom and online sources. They are actually able to uh, be more effective that way, but just knowing their limitations. Mm -hmm. And Scott and I are from the same states. We have very rural areas in North Dakota and trying to get attorneys to move to those areas is a huge challenge for us. I would agree with that. It's it's a struggle to provide the services with the number of attorneys who are available because they those offices haven't been able to fill the spots mm -hmm. either. But the applications coming in have also grown tremendously, um, mm -hmm. just even in the past, I'd say probably three years. So there's a backlog, and yeah. we know due process. We have to keep getting them through, and that's I think that's been a struggle. Yep. And that I've, ties into sorry, Gina, it ties into case flow management, which is also another curriculum. And I was going to say, as as a manager, as a leader of the court, these are things that you need to be aware of when your attorneys are having problems hiring. I just recently got an email from my judicial officer saying we don't have any attorneys who speak Spanish. So I had to reach out to the public defense services and said, what, what are you guys doing? And they said, we can't hire, nobody's applying. So how, you know, how are they? But they have informed me that they are getting um, support staff to become that assistance. But again, what does that reflect on then what does the court proceeding look like? Because has the attorney really had time to talk to their clients before coming into court? So. All of these things play into us as leaders and, and, and knowing and understanding those challenges. Mm -hmm. Some of the online uh, attendees are sharing that they've got uh, challenges dealing with contract defense firms or some appoint or um, courts where all defense attorneys are on contract and those folks have appointment limits. Mm -hmm. um, and as, again, as was said here um, in some courts, their uh, executive branch handles this. Uh, another challenge is reviewing uh, the reimbursement invoices as well. So some of the logistical things. Yes, and making sure they fall within their limits. Our court issues limits on how much they can bill. Um, so you have to think of it from a budget lens too. What do you, if you need an interpreter, if you need all of these things, how are we gonna pay for that as court? So as you're planning your indigent defense offices, if that's part of your duty, that's something to consider as well. Another function becomes the mandatory or the case load limits Another function becomes the mandatory or the caseload limits that indigent defense services can have because they can't take an infinite number of cases and provide adequate representation. 
So even though everyone likes to go to attorney A and everyone wants that person, mm -hmm. attorney A can only represent so many people and do so competently. Right, and then you have conflicts because they don't like attorney B, so they move on to attorney C, <laughs> D, Q, all of, they're going down the list. So. All right. Anything else that anybody wants to add before oh. I, I just want to, oh gosh, just keep, you hold on to that. <laughs> So the next one, we touched on it in indigent defense, but language access resources. Um, for the state of North Dakota, not only am I an administrator, but I am also appointed as our statewide language access coordinator. Um, so I maintain our interpreter database. Thankfully, I don't have to do all the contracts for all the people. We handle that in our local district. Um, but it's kind of its own animal. And going back to being a very rural court, it's, it's hard to have quality interpreters. So we end up using like a language access line. Um, and it's expensive. That's such a huge budgetary item. But it's so important because we need to provide this access to our court. So I kind of covered them. I, I want to make sure I give Tina enough time because I can talk about court administration for hours. <laughs> I could do the 16 hours. Um, so what are some, I'm going to, what are some challenges you guys are facing with your interpreters? Okay. I am a budget analyst, so I handle all of our uh, due process billing, and one of the issues that we've been seeing a lot lately is the request for increased rates. Um, not only as gas prices went up, inflation, Everything else is going up, so our interpreters are requesting more money, but we are limited on what we can pay them based on our legislative um, appropriations. Mm -hmm. So that's you know a challenge for us is keeping good interpreters or getting interpreters because we don't pay maybe as much as other circuits. Mm -hmm. Or other agencies. Everybody needs interpreters, so the private sector is going to out outbid us every time. I'm the ADA coordinator for my court, and I've been getting a lot of um, requests for interpreters. So we have certain types of cases that are to be heard in person, and a lot of them only want to appear via Zoom. So it's finding someone that will actually come in person. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask that how many people do remote interpreting. So I mean, th that, that's become an, an, a thing because we, we've had to, based on the scarcity uh, of resources. and then that little thing called pandemic. I would say in addition to that, um, it's also having, in the recruitment piece of it that we talked about yesterday, it's having certified interpreters. That's a big piece, because you'll get a lot of people who'll want to come in and say, oh, I can do it, or a clerk that comes in, oh, I can, I can do it, I speak this language or that language. But the time constraints, at least I know in, in Florida for us, if they've got that one year to get their certification and the test isn't, off, is, uh, isn't offered that frequently, mm -hmm. it's offered once or twice a year, we've struggled with that. I mean, we're lucky right now, but it's not an easy test either to get people. Thank you. No, we're struggling with that too in Arizona. We have a, certif a state certification and the, the people passing, we just don't, we're not seeing as many as we'd like to. Brandon, go ahead. Online, we've got challenges with being able to locate certain language interpreters or the availability for an interpreter to appear in person. Uh, the cost um, and others are sharing that they do have a p interpreters appear virtually and it works well for them. So. That's good. So kind of piggybacking on that, trying to find specific languages. Just so you guys know, the National Center has an awesome listserv that I belong to as our language access coordinator. So I get copies of all the people asking for languages I've never heard of. Um, so there is a resource out there if you are struggling finding certain dialects, certain languages. Um, they have a lot of that information or there's a pool of people that can maybe put you in touch with the one person that does actually speak it and qualify. Anything else on interpreters before we? Oh. So our office state court administrators is attempting to help us alleviate that. Sharing information amongst our sister circuits is hard, but our contract system, we're going to be able to eventually look up all of the interpreters. They're going to start with interpreters smaller. So I can tap into that resource up in Tallahassee should I need them and vice versa. They've also added a cooperative purchase um, attachment in our contracts, which has been non-existent. We're like, oh, I want to use you. I want to use you. But 
it requires a whole nother contract and a whole many, many more days spent editing. So there's actually going to be attachment. We agree to their terms, thus sharing the same uh, pay rate, and I'm not overpaying or underpaying somebody. So they are making the resources for us to use because of the pandemic. So it would not have happened if it wasn't for that. What a great opportunity. That's awesome that you guys are doing that. Anybody else have something similar like that? I don't, but I was um, going to add just uh, the challenges with educating other court staff on these uh, resources that are there. So yeah. court staff, other uh, court staff, so that when they're asked questions uh, or they're helping someone as well, that they know what these uh, uh, services are. Sure, so educating your staff. How many of you have had a judge come down to your office and say, I had this interpreter, it was the most miserable experience, and I never want to do it again? Well, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do, right? You have to provide the service. So those are challenging conversations you're going to face as court administrators, just reminding them of really why we're all here. All right, so the last one is something we're all very familiar with, um, is making a record. Uh, we have stenographers, we have electronic recorders, you have, um, we have staff attorneys in our courts doing some of our digital recording, and they just need to make sure that they're getting a verbatim record. I think this is something we're all very knowledgeable on, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but what are challenges you guys are seeing on this? I think we're all facing one similar challenge for sure. Staffing. Shortage. Shortage. No stenographers that, that want to come, like we have an issue, we don't pay as much for our stenographers, so they're not willing to move to North Dakota for some of our jobs. And the schools are closing and just trying to utilize our resources when we have all of these budget cuts. It's not just the pay. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. So Scott's reminding me that not everybody wants to live in North Dakota like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a wonderful state. Should consider moving there, but it's like the best kept secret of of the Midwest. Did you have something? Like one of the problems I see with making the record is you've gone to Zoom hearings. Is the fact one of the problems with the Zoom hearings I see is that a lot of people in the public seem to think of it as a DVR, and oh well, I didn't make my court hearing, but I'll just go back and catch up with it, <laughs> and well. My experience is that courts don't work that way. So there's been an education component that's gone along with that as well. Yep, we're still just showing up in their pajamas, laying in bed still, <laughs> <laughs> and trying to get a verbatim record while they're snoozing on their pillow. That's a whole another session. <laughs> Zoom <laughs> etiquette, right? Yeah. Online, they're sharing challenges of uh, purchasing the best recording equipment um, and digital storage when you do have that equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, CSR shortages, as we've noted, and adding uh, recording in certain types of cases as well. All good things. So I'm going to let you guys listen to Tina for a little bit. <laughs> All right. So programs and special services, I'm going to be covering these areas. Um, and again, I've talked about making the transition from California to Arizona. And one of the first things that I was hit with was the probation office was in the executive in California, and then I come to Arizona, and it's part of the courts. So how many people here have probation as part of their courts? It's about 50%. That's actually, again, so it varies from state to state. And, and some, it might not even be executive. It might be a private um, sourced out um, for, for some courts. At, but probation services is basically looking at that, um, the, the people that are going to oversee, making sure that the court's orders, the sentencing, whatever programs um, for either adult or juvenile offenders, and, and that's probation in a nutshell. But as an administrator, I, again, coming from California, I, I was handed this probation department, and it's like, well, I, I, I was never a probation officer. I don't have that under my belt. That's not a tool set that I was ever raised in going through the ICM program. We didn't talk about probation services. So I had to learn a whole new skill set. I had to learn a whole new technology. I had to learn things, things about evidence-based um, practices and making sure, you know, what are our recidivism rates? 
When I worked previously in California, I had the probation department, and they would tell me those things. But then I come over to Arizona, and those things are now responsible, that I'm responsible for. So understanding that. And some of the challenges, obviously, pandemic, how, how do you monitor people when you can't go to their houses and make sure they're, they're there or they're doing things that they're supposed to be doing? And what does that look like? Um, can somebody else, t any challenges that you encountered throughout or just in general? That's why he's in the front. <laughs> One of the big problems we've seen is a, they've used a lot of tethers on people who are on probations and whether people have landlines or not because some tethers are based to landlines and how people respond to that as well as if they try to charge people for the use of the tether as an alternative to incarceration, it becomes an ability to pay or a debtor prison type situation. Now oh, that's good. Um, GPS monitoring, making sure people ankle bracelets, and then how is that tied in as well? And again, is it is it paid by the defendant? Is it paid by the court? Um, and drug testing. Drug testing, and having ha you know, obviously, people aren't going places. When we were in lockdown, they couldn't even report to 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 those locations. Um, we were having some problems with providers of that. Some of the providers that did the drug testing shut down kind of during COVID. And so in making sure that we, we found, found people in the or com companies in the community that we could contract with. So again, these are things that I didn't know as uh, coming in as a manager, coming in as a court administrator, that I was going to have to deal with drug testing. Um, or evidence-based practices. What does that mean? How, how are we serving the probation community and making sure that they're not gonna recidivate? What, what are we doing as, as an agency ourselves? Um, okay, well, let's see. Court, well, I'm gonna go in. Just a couple of challenges online. I know okay. that, excuse me, the, um, the challenges of drug testing and other things that um, require varying levels of in-person contact were especially challenging during the pandemic, particularly if POs are um, following the evidence-based practices. Um, we we'll also shared that um, these are obviously leading to costs and one of the municipalities is currently unsupervised probation, but they'll be requesting uh, in their budget to begin a probation program for adults and juveniles. So. Yep, we got a couple more. that we um, work with, with with drug screening um, was doing oral swabs. They would mail it. The people would have to open it on Zoom in front of them. They would swab their mouth um, and then return the, and then seal it and return it back to them through the mail. Um, it wasn't an ideal situation, but it was something that we were able to do drug screens. So again, finding alternate ways when, when we can't um, function in our normal capacity. I would say in addition to that, in multi-circuit um, courts, it's a little bit complicated because probation is overseen by different entities in our different counties, so processes are different, um, policies are different, and it's figuring out what those are. I mean, some might fall under us with the courts, some might fall under the sheriff's department, some might fall under a city, um, and some probation might be more like pretrial services, and what we have to do because they all do things differently and they have the different requirements. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something I think that's been very unique to us that we're trying to have some commonality amongst them. The counties fight back a little bit about that though. <laughs> So we find uh, having a lot of um, collaboration round tables where you're sitting down, um, our probation department and our juvenile court, we sit down with their schools. We sit down with our behavioral um, health providers and our sheriffs, our law enforcement, and we talk about certain issues and it's like, how are you handling? We even brought our administrators, school administrators into our detention facility and we said, when you have send a kid off because maybe they were mouthing off or they did something in school and you have them arrested, this is what they're going to go through. And they're like, their eyes you know, were opened to what, what they were putting those kids through. Um, so I, just having that collaboration and, and working with your, your partners. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so the next is alternate dispute resolution. And um, ADR, um, uh, mediation is the biggest one, right? We see that in throughout a lot of our courts. Does anybody have mediation in their courts? Again, half, almost over half the room. Um, case types, what case types do you guys have it in? Family law is, again, the, the, the number one. I've seen it, our juvenile dependency cases have a mediation component. Anybody? Small claims, civil. Few hands going up. Dependency. All right. Um, there's also online dispute resolution where they are, we're now trying to get those small claims and maybe um, having part, parties meet online and do some of this dispute resolution beforehand. But ultimately, what, what is the goal of all these programs is to try to resolve these cases prior to actually coming into the courtroom. And at least in, on the dependency side, when I've seen these, uh, the, our mediators work with families, are they going to resolve everything? No, they're not. They're not going to get everything resolved, but they could get m m the majority of it. And then really the, um, the main issue is going to go before the court. So as an administrator, you have to know about mediation practices, right? You need, have to know... Um, what, what is the best way and how to implement those if you don't have one. We actually implemented a civil fast start program, um, but it's like fast track it. And, and we find ways to have those upfront settlement conferences and, and things before they get to trial. Does everybody else have, have some version of those? I think there was another session that, that, I don't know if it was yesterday or today, about the special masters or the, uh, you know, certain types of judicial, maybe pro tem judges who can hear the cases, again, a, a, a pre, before they actually go to trial to try to resolve these cases. Some of the comments from online beginning uh, wrapping up probation, but is consistent with the comments on ADR that probation services have expanded, providing alternative services in a court resource center, and essentially funding has been more challenging as those services expand. And then leading into ADR, a similar theme, some sharing they use ADR for criminal and civil. Um, of course, some courts now use virtual, so it's expanding the complexity there. Other courts saying they use it for animal cases and also criminal uh, cases as well. So a lot of expansion. So we'll save the animal cases for a little bit later when we talk about specialty courts. Um, anything else on this topic? Any other challenges you see with ADR? So again, trying to get the parties in the same room um, is, is one thing to actually talk to each other. Um, I, I, I find that um, our, having our mediation specialists, the people that are actually facilitating those conversations, they have to be good negotiators, right? They have to really be able to take the emotions out of it and try to work with the, the individuals. And I, and I think that might be part of the problem why some, some of the online stuff is, is a little harder because it's, it's still he said, she said, or she said, she said. Well, and a lot of our mediators are volunteers. And uh -huh. so when we transitioned to virtual, we lost some folks because it was a difficult transition for them. And so we lost a, a chunk of our volunteers. I think now they don't want to come back into the building because they don't have to drive or pay for parking or any of that stuff. But in the beginning, it was, it was rough. I think the not wanting to come back into the building is a, is, is a huge theme for a, a lot of, of the work that we do and trying to overcome that challenge and what does that look like for people moving forward. And online along the lines of the theme of uh, we're uh, guilty of our own success or victims of our own success is a, a comment that a number of judges are now, um, I guess they would hope they had more civil trials as opposed to the cases being resolved before trial. <laughs> You're taking away our work. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them actually uh, get paid by <laughs> the amount of work. So yeah, that could be a problem. All right, uh, next one is court-ordered services. So how many um, have court-appointed special advocates within their court that you actually manage? So I see a handful of people. Again, this is another thing that would change from California to Arizona. We. Um, Cal, um, California had 
costs available for the dependency cases, but it was an external volunteer type organization. Um, now I come to Arizona and it's embedded within all of the courts in Arizona that we have a CASA program and so we manage it. But again, it's a lot of volunteers. And so some of the challenges is making sure that you have enough volunteers for your children. Well, we have, you know, a couple of thousand kids in our system. We don't have that many volunteers. Um, so it's it, the challenge there is getting volunteers, um, retaining them, and then recruiting. Um, so now, did you have a comment? Our, our CASA program was in our court. We just moved our CASA program now where it's its own nonprofit for a lot of the reasons you just said. We have 3,000 kids, and through court processes and court funding, we can only get 100 or so CASAs. As a nonprofit, they'll be able to raise more money and hopefully service more families. So she brings up the, the funding and, and the nonprofit. We actually have a support council that is the nonprofit support council that provides that fundraising and ability to, to get um, grants and monies. And so that's how our court has kind of designated that out. But we still, again, have, have issues. And when we've hit 200 um, volunteers, we were ecstatic because, again, that's it's still a drop in the bucket. Um, other um, court-ordered services within the operations management, it touches on uh, professional services like psychiatric and clinical and having a psychiatrist. You have to send people out for evaluations. So you have to have contracts within your, um, within your community to send these people. Um, I think we're having the same type of issues. It's a resource. It's like we have one or two psychologists that you send to it, and then all of a sudden they're inundated. And wh where do you go to? You know, how do you how do you find others? Um, one of the things we did at juvenile court. Again, I just I loved my juvenile court. Yay! Hi, back home. Okay, um, they we we actually developed a clinical department. So we have a psychologist on staff. So we were able to pay them and have them, our juveniles, go through, get their evaluations. And now we've expanded it so that we have some other staff members who can do programs, actual group therapy, individual therapy, family therapy programs. So um, there are different alternatives if you can't, sometimes if you can't get it into the community, sometimes it you know, helps to bring it in-house. But again, when I was in California, that was something I'd never thought that I'd be overseeing in a clinical division um, as a manager. Let's see. Anybody else have anything on, on that or have had any issues with CASA or the court ordered specialty services? Zanel? No. We have a, a clinic for child study. And that was created like 100 plus years ago to address the unique problem that there weren't services there for the juvenile assessments and everything like that. And we're looking at it now, 100 plus years later, what does it need to be, how can we ensure that it is not duplicating services that are now available in the community, and then how do we pay for it? That's great. When you're done with that study, we need to share it. Consistent with that online, there continue to talk about ODR, uh, which is a, you know similar concerns for the court-ordered services, which is when you engage the vendors who are charging extra for these services, whether they're court-ordered services or ADR and ODR, uh, the perception of fairness issues that may arise. That's a good point. Okay, another one of my favorite topics is specialty courts. Um, so uh, drug, drug courts, right? That's the, the, the main specialty courts. But what other ki kind of courts do we have? Teen court. Teen court, yay. Uh, veterans court. Baby court. Behavioral health court. Homeless court. In the back. Um, okay, prostitution, sex traffic, sex, sex trafficking, human trafficking courts. Traffic court, foreclosure court or eviction court, DUI court, collections, 
Family family entry court? Re-entry court. We we have a family wellness court in our court as for like um, dependency cases, and then we have a healing to wellness court for our criminal cases. Nice. So one of the things as an administrator, you're, you're overseeing these specialty courts, and sometimes it can look at a, a different ways. Sometimes it's just a specialty docket. It's just a, a um, this is, these are the cases that we've lumped them together. We have a specific judge that at least is kind of knowledgeable in this, <laughs> hopefully, in the, in the subject matter, and then you're getting consistency, right? But then really to the, uh, the National Association for Drug Court Professionals, that model, to, to go that model, you're bringing in your partners, you're bringing in your behavioral health, you're bringing in the attorneys, both defense and um, your prosecutors, you're, the judge, staff, you're bringing in that whole team to look at these cases, to see what do these people need? How do we, how do we get them to the next stage in their lives? Right. So I, again, that's it's a it's a huge undertaking when you have a specialty court and you're going to that model and making sure all of those things and making sure you're measuring. You've outlined the problem that you want to address and that you're measuring it and 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 having seeing those outcomes. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to probably <laughs> move on. Um, but it is. It, Again, these are you see these types of courts coming up all over the place. And I, did somebody mention an animal welfare court? Because Pima County has one. <laughs> Anything from our online? Online folks are sharing a hybrid drug and wellness court, uh, as well as a teen court, environmental courts, and protection order courts as well. All right, moving, moving forward. So the next area of um, our competency is access and direct services. And a lot of these things we touched on, we've been talking about kind of in one form or another. Um, court user services, we have family court services, our self-help and our law libraries. So I, obviously a resource center, things that we can do to help our litigants when they come in. And I have to give um, props to um, the state of Hawaii for uh, um, giving us that photo, lovely photo on the PowerPoint. Um, but what kind of things do we have to do? Our law, 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 during the pandemic, our law library shut down, our self-help center shut, shut down. Did anybody shut down? Did you move to remote? In circuit court uh, for Prince George's County, Maryland, we went remotely. Remote. So I, I loved that I heard some remote um, work that, that they were doing like Zoom sessions where it's like you can uh, schedule an appointment with a law librarian or the self-help resource. Um, so again, pandemics kind of gave us some opportunities where we weren't allow, allowing folks to come into the courthouse. We're still able to, to offer those services. Another area is I, I heard somebody talk about access um, ADA. Somebody's an ADA uh, coordinator. Um, we got to make sure that our buildings, are people are able to get in. People have the resources. If they can't afford Zoom, how, how are they coming to court? Um, if they don't have internet in their in their um, homes, um, or you know, making sure our access, we have not only language, but our, our, for our deaf, for our cart, cart providers, which is, goes back to the stenographers who provide the, the cart services. Um, so what kind of other opportunity or challenges have you guys seen around ADA? Tina, if I could add something. Yeah. We have very old courthouses. So making sure our older courthouses, our aging courthouses, continue to be a start, ugh, I'm not going to be able to say the word, accessible to everybody. Yeah, um, we have some really historic, we have some beautiful historic courthouses, and they are not ADA compliant. So um, some of our counties have had to build new courthouses. And you know, finding the funding of that for that is, it, it was a work in progress for one county. It took them a decade to actually get there. We had a really good training um, that a number of our judges attended. Um, it was an optional lunch, lunch and learn, but um, on invisible disabilities. And it's really important for judges to recognize and sort of build in some accommodations into their 
courtroom practice for those folks who may have disabilities that you can't see. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the next one I, I thought was interesting when I, I started reviewing the operations manual, um, operations management, because courtroom operations, I grew up, I was a courtroom clerk, and that was just like the part, I, that's a huge part of, of court being a court. Then again, I realized I left California, I came to Arizona, the clerk of the court function was separate. They were an elected official. So while as a courthouse and you have judicial officers who have courtroom clerks, how do you manage when they're not your staff? I mean, so um, having that dichotomy was, was strange for me. Does anybody else, enter, you know, how do you, how do you overcome that? Communication. Communication. That's nice when you get it. <laughs> and, and sometimes you don't. Um, seeing it right now in one of our courts and it's just communication communicating back and forth the manager making sure that they they have the that they understand what our needs are and then what where that person may be lacking where that where they need to work better okay. and then back there so in one jurisdiction i worked in uh we went to the supreme court and the supreme court uh promulgated a rule that required the elected officials to um, work with the chief judges and court administrators. So the requirement was put there. For us, the um, courthouse is where all of our court staff is, but all the elected and outside parties, we give them offices. We assist with IT because they don't have the IT staff, telephones, copy machines, whatever. So it's almost like they have become a hybrid staff. We include them on everything. Our you know, employee appreciation, things like that. So that's helped because we have a direct connection daily. Yeah, it, it really is does become a blended um, environment, especially when you have to provide the computers because they're on your case management system. Um, they have to update your information as well. So it's it's very interesting. A big issue. A big issue that we found was making sure that the judges realized that they weren't independent islands and that they had to operate as part of a general protocol. That there are no judges in the room. No, <laughs> <laughs> you can't just establish, okay, in my courtroom you're going to do this way, and then you have another courtroom do it that way. In none of the protocols that the judges establish track what the clerk has established for their record or document retention protocols. Which leads right into my next, my next topic is records <laughs> and records retention. Um, so we got we to gotta bust through. We have a few more, <laughs> few more topics to go through. Um, but you guys have been great. This, these are the things that we are addressing and looking at as court leaders. So records, how many still have file rooms? I do, yeah. Um, and back in the day, you had to consider volume and, oh my gosh, where's the next shelf going to go and we're going to build on top of other shelves and the weight requirement for the floor of all these files and, and outside storage, storage. Well, now we've moved to digital. So a lot of those things you don't, you don't see as much. How many are fully paperless? Okay, I've got like four people and I'm going to be getting your names afterwards. Um, yeah, that's something, it's still kind of the hybrid. We're still not quite out of paper. Um, there's, we just can't seem to get away from it. But again, as a manager, what are those requirements for records, for retention? How long do you keep them? What does that look like? Um, and so I'm going to, there's filing fees, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm going <laughs> to kick it over to Kelly because she thought she could talk a long time about court operations. So. Hey, that's okay. We were worried we were going to have to stretch this out, have some bonus questions, but we're doing good. All right, so I'm hoping everybody raises their hand, but who after the last couple of years with this thing called COVID have absolutely no knowledge of technology? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? No, everybody should be sitting on their hands. We're tired. And Roger, I'm sorry, people are tired of technology. Like, it's just a lot, right? Uh, when I first, I started in the clerk's office and I never thought I would have to know as much as I do now about technology. I thought there would be a person and they would be worrying about the technology um, and I wouldn't have to think about it, but that's just not how life is. Um, like I've said multiple times, we're in a rural jurisdiction. We don't have IT 
on hand, on staff. They live four hours away. So I am an IT person now. So I will claim that with, with accolades. But what are some of the things we need to know about technology in court administration and in operating our courthouses? So one thing that's kept pace, I think, and kind of moved with COVID is the information security piece. So I mean, you know, we're seeing courthouses now with data breaches and, you know, being shut down. That's a huge thing. Yep, information security, cyber security, that's a, that's a good buzzword these days. Well, taking a step back to the previous topic, you have the intersection between the records, as you digitize those records, how you maintain those records in the digital format and make sure that they're accessible for the required time period, and how do you know who owns those records? Because if you are using something out in the cloud, where are they stored? Do they have the same level of security as your traditional vault that they have in Tucson? So just a lot of issues like that come into play. Yes, absolutely. Whoever thought you'd have to learn about this thing called the cloud and that there was just information in it, right? Um, but you brought up a good point, servers, and making sure all of your servers are secure and backing up your information because we're so digitized. What happened if it was all gone? There's no record then. We're so reliant on it. So I trust in the Rogers and the Ellens to make sure that all of our <laughs> stuff is secure. But uh, oh. online, we've got right. some challenges with archiving uh, folks working towards becoming paperless. Um, some who e-file but print everything for uh, the judge. Uh, but it, it, electronic is very helpful in transparency. And other challenging with cost and the scanning. Yes, and the time that takes with scanning. When we first went on our electronic case management system, there were hours and hours and hours and hours that you spent scanning. So. We've moved in. <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> Tina has her little barcodes. But, um, but it's really brought us a lot of opportunities, the, especially the pandemic. It has shoved us about probably, I don't know, 50 years into the future. And just it's really made us better leaders having to think about all these things. Um, how many of you are responsible for your continuity of operations plan, your coop cogs? How many of you, it's your favorite part of your job? <laughs> I knew Rick would raise his hand. I had to get one. Like, I'm a planner, but Coop Cog, sometimes I just get stuck in it. Like, well, we'll just think of it on the fly. Like, we'll, we'll figure it out. So having those Coop Cog plans are just instrumental. Um, we were very fortunate in my jurisdiction. We were planning for a flood and having to move staff remote and having to do all of these things, and then the pandemic happened. So we were in a very good place. So it was... It was easy. It was easy, right? Not easy. So in our COOP plan, we have realized now that the book is useless. So this yeah. huge <laughs> guideline no one is going to look at when you're in the middle of a major crisis. And the pandemic taught us that. So we're now going back and um, working on functional plans in each department. So we have an analyst actually going into each department, talking to each supervisor and asking them those questions. What do you need to do your job? And you are, and talking to criminal arraignments, you are number one on the coup plan. Mm -hmm. Do you have what you need to do if there is no internet, no email, no case management system? How are you going to arraign people? So That's awesome. Can they come to our courts? <laughs> oh, you got Don behind you here. I'm from Louisiana, so there hasn't been a year yet that I hadn't had to implement the COOP plan. So um, what we learned is um, lots of checklists. I have an electronic system that the second I activate the COOP, it's sending out a notice to the clerk of court, because I, I help the clerk with their stuff too. It's sending something to our IT staff what to back up. And I've set up key staff teams. They rotate. They have... Um, they already have a cell phone and they have a computer that's ready to go. They just need to evacuate with it and do whatever. Originally, Louisiana set up um, sister courts that you would evacuate to. That doesn't work in this day and age. So we know we're going to have to work remotely and what do we need to do. And then I've also created all kinds of electronic documents because... The last few years, I've, I've done a closure order, and we couldn't return. So I've had to do a closure order from Florida or something, mm -hmm. 
and get it to the Supreme Court and make it official. And then we also have all of these groups now. So I have um, email groups, I have press groups, things like that that I can automatically send out. That's great. And you, much like where we live, um, have to plan for flooding a bit, right? So you have to have a plan for the people to not even be able to work from their own home. They have to have a backup site or somewhere a little bit more safe to do that. But I think one of the most important things is communication. If only you know your COOP plan, who is that helping? No, nobody's going to know what they need to do. Rick? Brandon. Oh, Brandon, Brandon has one too. We require in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that all continuity of operations plans be certified by the president and judge. And in that certification, it requires that that president and judge says that they certify that elements of all of the continuity of operations plans have been disseminated to all court related stakeholders, users and such. Whether that's done, you have to ask each individual judicial district, but that is a requirement. That's good. We have some coop enthusiasts online as well, uh, working through Rick's friends, uh, prepping and archiving that helps significantly with the coop. Uh, others create handbooks with step-by-step -step instructions similar to Dawn. Um, all the managers and the presiding judge have the book for emergencies. Uh, it has templates for public announcements, verbiage for recordings for staff instructions to operate the notification system as well. Um, others use OneBook or SharePoint so that other folks uh, have access. Um, and then one also mentioned the next step, which is tabletop exercises. Oh, awesome. So. We'll take one more and then we'll get through facilities and security so quick. So being from Pennsylvania, I can attest what Rick said um, about uh, Pennsylvania's robust uh, coup plans. But what I can, I can just add is um, what I found during the pandemic um, with our coup plan, the most important piece of the coup plan was identifying those essential functions. So literally within that first week when it hit and we had to make um, arrangements, I was able to grab that list and go to the presiding judge and saying, these are the things that we need to cover today. And it just was the building block for our blueprint. And we were able to get up and running like right away. We never actually closed. So we were able to just keep business going because we had that um, essential functions document and had previously dispersed it to all of the stakeholders so everybody was already on the same page. That's awesome. Literally flipping a switch to the next next phase. Um, so just quickly, we're going to go through facilities manage management and security. So facilities management, that's literally the kitchen sink. Like you have to worry about the kitchen sink and the break room everywhere. <laughs> so that's where a lot of that comes from too. But things you never thought of, you know, making sure your doorways are wide enough, making sure the access, um, that facilities are safe. We live in a very different age now where there's a lot of violence and volatility and we just don't know when or where it's going to come from. We had a judge shot in our courthouse before I worked there and it was the person nobody suspected. So you can't, you can't stereotype people. You can't do any of that because you just don't know who it's going to be. Uh, does anybody have anything just bust in on facilities management or security that they want to share? If not, we'll wrap it up so you guys have a couple minutes to do. Aloha, miha kapaki. Um, in our court, we also had our judge shot, um, but the person jumped over to the clerk and grabbed her scissors, stabbed him, and then got the gun from the bailiff. That bailiff was fired, and it, it was it was bizarre. Yeah. But we do mandatory hands-on combat mm -hmm. every year. Um, I make my staff do it. Yeah. And so that clerk that was there is still there, and she still got PTSD, but we do make them do... Um, combat training. Wow. Yeah. Just scary, right? Brandon, is there anything online before we wrap it up? Okay. So honestly, as court administrators, court professionals, um, we may not be making the decisions in the courtroom, but we really have to worry about everything that's happening in there, outside, on the front lawn, everything. Um, it's exhausting, right? You never know you need to know all the things. But the cool part is, like, we are such a huge part of carrying out the mission of our courts. So I want you all to give yourself a little pat on the back that we're good. And the best part is, here at NACOM, you really have opportunities to share like this and learn from your colleagues. So if you're not a member, this is my plug to become a member of NACOM um, and just tap into that network. 
So the last thing I have, and I'll let Tina do a quick little thing, is that again, it's the core champion program. So if you want to obtain the structured response, there's these forums you can do in the back just to put your email on, or you can email um, me directly, which will be on a slide in a second, to obtain that structured response. So. Okay, again, as court leaders, as court administrators, there is so many functions that we have to be knowledgeable about, or as those who aspire to move on, you might have to do, and if you move to another jurisdiction, another court, another state, another type of, of um, case type, these are things that you might need to, to know about. And we just wanted to give you a taste of that throughout this, this course. And, and hopefully you got a little bit of something um, out of that. And, and I really like the summary where, um, because it talks about kind of what you need to do, just identifying. And I want to shout out to, to Rick's um, friend over in Pennsylvania who mentioned essential functions. It's really identifying those things, um, whatever area you're going to be working on. What are those components? What are those functional requirements? Whatever the program or access or function it is that you're going to be doing, what is it really pushing your court's mission to? And then develop. What kind of development do you need to do? Is it through uh, procurement? Is it managing? Is it collaborating with um, finding the players you need to collaborate with? And then continual application of the requirements and laws and statutes. And then finally, recognizing whatever is coming down the pike. Some, who, who would have guessed the pandemic, right? But some of you started planning COOP, which then able were, you were able to kind of function. And we had just looked at our coop plan, we dusted it off the shelf, and we said, hey, we got to get back to this. And then boom, pandemic hit. So um, now we're like, hey, we got to get back to that. And what did we do during the pandemic? And let's, let's go back and what were our lessons learned? And how do we update that document? So I think that's... I have one more shameless plug. <laughs> um, Tina and I are both members of the core committee, which deals with all of our education. Um, Rick is a, the chair of our education committee. We, our committee meeting meets tomorrow, since I have a captive audience, at 11 a.m. in 102 D and E. So we would love it if you would come join us. There's opportunities if you ever wanted to do training or help us modify our curriculum. So. That Dan? curriculum is, uh, was recently oh, modified yes. just this past year. Yes. Year so our, our, our operations management curriculum, the big, the big binder, um, is online and it was recently updated last year, as Rick has pointed out. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? We want to thank you for this very engaging, informative session. Thank you for all the plugs. Um, and I have one more plug for you. Please rate your uh, evaluation in your app for the speaker and this session. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Yep.